own every bit of it. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. What a great worship service. Wow. For those of you that don't know me, good morning. My name is John, and uh, thank you, John Z. Yes, thank you. Uh, my last name does start with a Z. My wife and I are directors of Life 365, which is our philosophy of ministry and our ministry efforts here at CLC. And uh, Eddie and Karen are on a vacation. So we're so thankful that we have pastors that know it's important to take a break because it set the example. And so we hope that those of you that are on vacation, if you're on CLC live stream with us this morning, we want to say thank you to you for being with us. And we're sorry that you're gone, but we're so glad that you decided to be with us today. Um, today's topic is a little bit difficult because we're going to talk about grace. And I... I just want to say that I believe that grace is one of the most misunderstood things that the church is dealing with today. And it's because we love to receive it, but we don't really know how to give it. So, Chris and Stacy Waldman, our pastors of Prepared and Rich Families, did a really good job three weeks ago talking about how to make love last. If you didn't catch that message, I want you to go on to clcrala.com go to the time series and take a look at that. Chris and Stacy said something that I thought was really profound, but they didn't talk on the topic, they just made the statement, and I think it's worth going back to the statement, because we don't want to look over things that are powerful. Chris and Stacy were laughing with each other because Chris sleeps with the fan on, and Stacy doesn't like sleeping with the fan on. Any fan sleepers in here? Okay, I just want to let you know that there are some people in the world who are not fan sleepers. I am not one of those people. I am a fan sleeper. My wife, on the other hand, is a non-fan sleeper. So there are three types of fan sleepers. The ones, the twos, and the threes, which are the settings on the fan. Low, medium, and high. I am a three. Mary is a zero which means we get to about two, and that's about all she can take. Chris is a fan sleeper. Stacy is not. Chris was saying that every night, this is every night. I don't, you, you may have not caught this, but it was really unique to me because this message had already been planned at that point. So I kind of knew what we were going to talk about. I had already had my notes, but they said something that I thought was really profound. Chris wakes up and the fan's off because Stacy has unplugged the fan and plugged the iron in. But she, yes, right? So think this through. Every night he wakes up, the fan is off because the iron's plugged in, which means every night Stacy unplugs the fan, plugs the iron in, unplugs the iron, puts the ironing board and iron away, and doesn't plug the fan back in. That would be a clue that she doesn't want the fan on. And Chris makes the statement, I don't understand. It's as simple as getting up, plugging it in, turning it on. And Stacy said, sometimes it just takes a lot of grace. Now, we look at the word grace and we think about it a little differently. Most of the time we hear the word grace, we often think about the expression unearned or unmerited favor meaning the grace of God showed to us by way of salvation through Jesus Christ. That's grace. Because it says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that it is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And that's about where we leave grace. But when we take a look at what grace means today... And if I were to say, are you a gracious host? If someone comes to your house after you've prepared a meal and they come late, are you gracious? When they sit down at the table with no table manners and they eat more than what you think they should eat, are you gracious? What does it mean to be a gracious host? That type of grace is patient, merciful, 
forgiving, pardoning. That type of grace is the grace that defines who we are as Christians. Because it is not what someone did to me. It is who I am and how I respond. That's the type of grace that we have to talk about today. That type of grace is what we would call axiological. Axiological means it's the way I process value. If I look at a, a Rembrandt, I'll say that's beautiful. But if I look at my child's coloring outside the lines, I put that on my fridge and I say that's beautiful. I don't value the artist, I value the product. And I value the artist in spite of the product. Because what my child does is precious to me, but you might look at it and say, Ugh. Value. How do you value? What's your axiological worldview? What's your outlook? Do you value things? Because I value people because they're my forever friend. I want you to look at the person next to you and say, I'm going to be with you forever. For those of us, for those of us who, I want you to think about this. this is, yes, it can be funny. Yes, there's a good time to look at that person and say that. Understand that as, as children of the Most High God, as sons and daughters of the kings, we are co-laboring with each other through Jesus Christ to be sons and daughters of God, which means in heaven we'll rule and reign as princesses and princes, and we will be together forever. Forever. So it doesn't matter what somebody does to us today because in eternity it's not going to matter. Whatever the hang up or problem is that happened yesterday has no eternal value unless you make it eternal value. Because the problem is we look at these problems in the temporary and not the eternal. Sometimes it just takes a lot of grace. Grace is forgiving somebody without an apology and with no expectation of getting one ever. That's grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve and mercy is not getting what you do deserve. That's the grace that we have to look at. That's the way we have to look at it today. Why is it important? Because the things that are difficult to us interrupt our ability to give grace. It says in Proverbs 19.11, a person's insight gives him patience, and it is his virtue to overlook an offense. So if you have understanding or insight, it will give you patience. So if you understand how something happened, you're supposed to have patience with the other person that did it. And it is your virtue or character to overlook what you don't like. Your character, the product of Christ in me, is my character to say, I don't like it, but I'm going to overlook it. I'll allow it. I'll allow it. I'll permit why? Because you're my forever friend. You are my forever friend. We will be together forever. And in a thousand years from now, none of that even matters. The only thing that matters is that we show each other the love and respect that we have for each other through Jesus Christ. I don't have to like you. There is no rule that says we've got to like each other. But I'm not going to sit there and give you a hard time because you're not me. I'd never get anything done. Today is an important day in our nation's history. You may not know it. But on June 24, 1863, 155 years ago, something could have altered the way that we live life today. General Lee crossed the Potomac River with the Confederate Army with one goal, and that was to lay siege to Philadelphia as a staging point 
to destroy the Union and the North. And he was met by General Meade and the Union Army. And they fought for three days at the Valley of Gettysburg. And that battle ranks in history as the bloodiest battle in American history. 50,000 men died in three days. That was at the midway point of the Civil War. Up to that point, 300,000 people had died. 300,000 Americans had died in two years. And at the midway point, the Union, led by General Meade, defeated the Confederates and pushed them to the Potomac, and they could not cross the Potomac River because it was swollen because of flooding. And Abraham Lincoln, from the White House, said, attack do not convene a council of war. Do not convene a committee of war. Destroy the enemy. End the war. Spoiler alert, the war lasted four years, and this was at the two-year point. So what happened? They defeated the Confederate army. They could not retreat. They were finished. Meade disobeyed the president's order. He convened a committee of war. They counseled. They talked tactics, and in that amount of time, in less than a day, the flooding receded, and Lee was able to cross the Potomac and retreat. That decision cost America 400,000 lives, because that's the death toll after the Valley, the valley of Gettysburg. Lincoln was furious. I want you to understand, the President of the United States of America gave an order to the general in charge and he disobeyed it. In any other time of war, that is punishable by death. Some of you have served. You know what it is to receive an order. You do not have the luxury of whether or not you will obey it. The oaths have not changed in over 200 years, they still remain the same. Article 92, failure to obey a lawful order from a commissioned officer or superior commander, punishable by death in the time of war. Lincoln was furious. He was quoted to have said, my God, what does this mean? All we had to do was reach out our hand and grab the enemy and they would have been ours. Any general worth his salt could have gone to the battlefield and licked him. If I had gone there, I would have whipped him. That's exactly what he said. And he sat down and he wrote me a letter to explain how upset he was. Think about that for a second. The president's mad and he writes a letter. How many of you have gotten mad and started to write a text message? Right? Oh, it's on. I got thumbs all day long. And when they get tired, hunt and peck. <laughs> the only reason we know that Meade didn't receive the letter and that Lincoln had the letter was because it was found in Lincoln's desk after he was assassinated. Sealed and never sent. The letter was actually very polite. I don't have the time to read it, but just it wasn't anything like you would expect. There was no anger, there was no malice. There was no hostility. He just said things like, my dear general, I don't think you understand the gravity of this situation. There's a lot of four-letter words that were missing. <laughs> but Abraham Lincoln learned something early in his career, and it was to never criticize a person when they're down, because it doesn't add value. Because he had a habit of doing that. In those days, they didn't have Facebook like we have now. What they did, what Lincoln did, was he would write a letter and have it mass produced, and it would be a leaflet, and he would throw them in the streets near people's houses. So they would come out to get their mail and see a letter, and then they'd pick it up, and it would be this hostile critique of his adversary, anonymous. Sound familiar? Oh, we see it on Facebook. An anonymous, right? I'm just going to just put somebody on blast. Hashtag, sorry, not sorry. But 
that cost him one day because his opponent got really mad that he talked bad about him, found out it was Lincoln and challenged him to a duel. Lincoln was not prepared for that. He had to take fencing lessons. He had to go buy a sword. He met with the opponent. And before they had to kill each other, their seconds were able to stop in and convince him to do otherwise. And from that day forward, Lincoln said, I will never again critique a man while they're down. So here he is. He, he could have won the war. Someone's disobeyed his order. He's mad. He chooses not to send the letter. 400,000 lives. Look, I get it that people sometimes have done something that has made you mad after you told them not to, but I can guarantee you it didn't cost 400,000 lives. And 300,000 people didn't die before that decision. So if Lincoln can give grace, it's the virtue to overlook an offense. Think about that. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Can I tell you a story? When I was young in the Marines, I was given a troop of 60 Marines to watch over and train. And our job was to train them in combat. And one of the missions was to train them in dismounted patrols, which means you get out of the vehicle, you put on your pack, you put on your rifle, you put on your gear, you walk through the woods. It's not a hike. And you train to assault the enemy who's assaulting you at any point. Dismounted patrol training. My job was to take one of the students that was with me, one of my Marines, one of the trainees, to take them into the wood line and to set up an ambush. So when the troops came through, that we would ambush them to correct their response, whether they were flanking or whatever the maneuver was. The guy that was with me was 220 pounds. I was 160 pounds. He was a private. I was a sergeant. He was under my charge. I had to take care of him. We get into the wood line, and he falls over backwards. And he lands on the only broken engineer stake in a 50-mile radius. A broken engineer stake, it's a tent stake sticking out of the ground, sharp to a point, and it went into the lower lumbar of his back. It missed his kidney by a half an inch, and it missed his spine by a quarter of an inch, three inches into the meat, right in his lower back. We're in the middle of the woods, 12 miles from the hospital, and I've got a Marine who weighs 220 pounds, fallen over an engineer stake, and is impaled. And he's, and, he's, and he's mine, right? I gotta take care of him. We're 250 meters from the safety vehicle. So I get him up, and as I pull him up, I can, I hear the sucking wound close as the weapon projectile or whatever it is comes out. What? You know what I'm saying? Some of you know what I'm saying. You don't you want to watch your blood drawn? No, I'm good. Just do it. We get 20 meters. He passes out. I got, a, I got 230 meters to take him to the safety vehicle. So I put him on my back in a fireman's carry, and I carry him to the safety vehicle and I get in the car, and I gotta drive him to the hospital. And I want you to understand something. The only thing going through my mind was that I'm gonna have to make the phone call that no leader wants to make, and the parent's gonna have to hear the phone call that no parent wants to hear, which is, your son died in training because I told him to do something. It wasn't combat, it was training. And it was my fault because I told him to do that. Nobody wants to get that call and nobody wants to make it. We get him to the hospital. They put the smelling salts in front of him and of course he just wakes up and they pack him full of gauze, put medication in there, give him ibuprofen, stitch him up, give him water and we take him back to the field and he completes his training. No big deal.
But then I have to go talk to my boss and I have to explain what happened. And understand, folks, when, when you have somebody that you're responsible for and they get hurt, you have to give an explanation as to why. So I walk into my boss's office, my career is on the line, and I'm looking at my master sergeant, and he's pretty serious. And he says, tell me what happened. So I walk him through it. He said, what were you thinking? And I said, I, I just kept thinking about making the phone call. He said, I'm just glad he's okay. I'm just glad he's okay. My boss looks at me, he goes, I think you understand what it is to take care of somebody. I think you understand how important it is to take care of somebody. And he gave me grace. Nothing happened. I could have been court-martialed, reduced in rank, stripped of all my responsibilities, and I got nothing. Why? Because he gave me grace. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. But I got it anyway. Lincoln could have fired Meade. He could have had him court-martialed. He could have had him executed. But he would have lost the best general he had. He would have demoralized the Union Army. And he would have given the enemy the upper hand. And I have, to, I have to believe that Lincoln followed these two principles. And one of these quotes is from Rick Smith. And the other quote is from Andy Stanley. And it says, everyone's behavior makes sense if you have enough information. And think about that. I don't have to agree with what you did, but at least what you did made sense if I have enough information. I don't have to agree with it, but at least it makes sense. And Andy Stanley says, everything people say, do, and think makes sense to them. Everything you do makes sense to you. Sometimes the thing you say, it comes out of your mouth, and as you hear it, you're like, whoa, that came out totally different than I expect. That sounded different in my head. But still, the things we do make sense to us. Otherwise, we wouldn't do them. And so we need to have that thought process when we look at the actions of others, our axiological worldview, the value we have for them. Lincoln knew that if he punished me, it would really impact an already bad situation. And Meade was a brilliant tactician. And I want to let you... Giving grace is supernatural. There's nothing natural about giving grace. Because in the natural, it's just so easy just to judge people and be critical and make a decision and just cut people off. But giving grace is supernatural. So if you want to tap into the supernatural, if you want to let the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your mind and heart in Christ Jesus, then it's giving grace. Proverbs 16.32 says, Patience is better than power and controlling one's temper than capturing a city. I believe that the one thing that destroys our ability to give grace to people is our temper. Over and over in Proverbs, it says it multiple times, but it, it says the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. When we are critical, when we are angry, when we make decisions in anger, it hurts our ability to be eternally grace-giving. You are my forever friend. There is nothing you can do that will change that. Whether I like it or not, you're going to be in heaven with me forever. And, on, and in heaven, we're going to look back on situations where we upset each other, and we're going to go, man, did we have it wrong. Because it doesn't matter. Corey Tenboom, author of the book The Hiding Place, her and her family hid Jews from the Nazis during World War II. In 1944, February 28th, she, her sister, and her dad were arrested by the Nazi party. Her father died in prison few weeks after being arrested and then her and her sister were shipped to a political concentration camp where they were kept for over 10 months her sister got ill and was not able to work and while she was in the field a Nazi beat her until she was almost a bloody pulp 
and the Nazi dropped the baton on accident. Corey was right there and was reaching down to pick it up, and Betsy said, don't forgive him, give him grace. And I want to challenge you with this. How many of you have children? If someone was beating your child, walked away and dropped the baton, what would you do? You come after my kid, you better kill me. Because that's the only thing that's going to save you. Because you signed, you signed the end of it. Corey Ten Boom's last living relative, her best friend, her sister, is being beaten because she's sick because the Nazis had put him in camp, her father has died, and the only reason they did that is because they were protecting God's people. Do you think she had a reason to be upset? She picked up the baton, she tapped the Nazi on the shoulder, she handed the baton and said, here, you drop this. Betsy told Corey, I feel sorry for the Nazis, and Corey's response was, are you crazy? And Betsy said, understand that when Hitler falls, these people will have nothing. Betsy Ten Boom died 15, later, or 15 days later. And after that, Corey was released because of a clerical error and a technicality on paperwork. Seven days after her release, all women of her age group were sent to the gas chambers. She could have defended Betsy and no one would have said that she was wrong for doing it. But her act of mercy and grace in that moment allowed for her freedom. If she had attacked that soldier that day, she would have died and Betsy would have died, without a doubt. But because she showed grace, it gave God the opportunity to complete the work that he had for her through her. Her grace made a way. Let's take a look at what she says, forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. You get mad. I get it. But I don't think anyone's beat your sister in front of you. The will of forgiveness can function regardless of the temperature of your heart. And then she says, Discernment is God's call to intercession, not fault finding. Think about that. When you get a discernment or a check in your spirit that something's going wrong, how many of you go seek to find evidence to prove it? I know I do. Oh, oh really? Hmm. And then I go seek evidence. Corey says... That's not what God gives you discernment for. He gives you discernment so you can pray about it, so you can intercede. Because fault finding, looking for faults, is critical. And a critical spirit will lead you to a place where God will no longer operate. It is better to stay in a place of peace than to enter into a place of turmoil because you're so angry. Psalm 133, 1 through 3 says, How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. It is like fine oil on the head, running down on the beard, running down Aaron's beard onto his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon falling on the mountains of Zion, for the Lord has appointed the blessing life forevermore. Giving grace is not just a choice, it's a commandment from God. It's an anointed process, all the way from the top to the bottom. It's like fresh rain on a hot day. Grace just, all of a sudden, it just makes everything better. And some of you know what I'm talking about. But we get so caught up in that frustration. It's interesting that David wrote this. Because in the first 22 years as king, this, listen to what happened to him. This is the first 22 years David, the anointed king. His best friend Jonathan has died in battle. And now David is anointed and appointed to be king. He cheats on his wife. 
The baby from that adultery dies. His firstborn son rapes his daughter. Then his bro- her brother kills his firstborn son. So David's thirdborn son kills his firstborn son. His firstborn son rapes his daughter. He has two sons that die out of childbirth. And then the third son who killed the other son tries to overthrow the kingdom. That's, that's like within the first 10 years of him being king. You think we got problems? Anybody got problems like that? He loses four children in a process of 10 years. And they're all supposed to be king. Every single one of them is supposed to be king. He loses four of them. His entire throne, gone. He adopts Mephibosheth, who is his best friend, Jonathan's son, which is the guy who's supposed to, who could be the king, but he can't be because he's not anointed anymore. He adopts him, and as the third-born son, Absalom, is trying to overthrow him, he's leaving Jerusalem, and Mephibosheth's servant comes to him and says, here's a bunch of food, here's water, here's provisions so that you can survive in your exile. And he says, well, where's Mephibosheth, your, your master? And he says, your servant Mephibosheth has betrayed you. So not only is the guy that he extended grace to that he didn't have to betrayed him, but he's lost three sons up to this point. And the the fourth one that he's about to lose is trying to kill him. He comes back after after the third one is dead. So now he's lost four sons. He's sitting on the throne. He's got his kingdom back. And here comes the guy that betrayed him, Mephibosheth. And he says, oh, no, I didn't betray you. This guy, my servant, he lied to you. How many of you have kids again? You ever have kids that do this? I didn't do it. Wasn't me. It was the other guy. What do you do? You take them apart, right? Move them to separate areas. Tell me. All right, got that. Tell We interrogate them. We find the truth. David could have found the truth. He could have had both of them tortured. He could have come to the end of his ropes. He could have got to the bottom line. But you know what David did? Nothing. He gave both of them grace. You know why? Because on one side, it's the son of his best friend. And on the other side, it's the guy who took care of him when he was running for his life. What do you do? He could find the truth. But God didn't give David discernment to find the fault. He interceded for both of them and said, I'm going to give you both grace. You've got to count the cost. Because there are some things that you will say that can never be unsaid. There are some words that if you chose to use them today, it would change and alter the course of your life. And there are some things that once done can never be undone. So we have to count the cost with our decisions. Grace gives us the ability to count the cost, to have wisdom beyond the current situation, to look to the eternal and say, you're my forever friend. There's nothing you can do that will hurt me. You're my brother. You are, we're born of the same person. There's nothing you can do that will change that. You're my sister. You're my mother. You're my father. That will never change. I tell my sons all the time, and they, they don't like it anymore. But I say, who am I to you? daddy. When's that going to change? Never. That's right. Don't you forget that. Because you know who we are to him? You know who you are to me? You're my forever friend. You are my forever friend. We're going to be together in heaven forever in a thousand years from now. Whatever it is that had a big deal is going to be nothing. We're not even going to remember it. So why does it matter now? In the back of your seat back pockets, if you're in the front row, there's two behind you, or in the seat back pocket in front of you, there's a pencil. This is for you. We bought these for you. I, I, I contemplated this whole message just on a pencil. I almost felt like I was just going to talk about the pencil, and I thought, well, maybe that's just not enough content. 
Great, great pencil sermon, John. But I think it's pretty simple. I, I like this illustration a lot, and I think that it brings this scripture into context. In Colossians 3.13, it says, Accepting one another, forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, you must also forgive. Above all, put on love, the perfect bond of unity, and let the peace of the Messiah to which you were called in one body control your hearts. This pencil has four components. It has a graphite rod that runs through the middle. It has wood on the outside. It has a copper band, and it has a rubber eraser. I want you to think about and imagine if you were the graphite rod. If that's who you are, your purpose in life is to be the graphite rod. Envision yourself as a pencil tip. Do you understand what your function is? It's to get sharpened and to have your face pressed into the ground and drug around. That's your job. Your job is to have your face smashed into the ground. Anybody want that job? No, no thanks. But you can create beauty. You can write wonderful words. Because the measure of effectiveness for the pencil tip is based on the author who requires it. So you have a purpose. You might be the pencil tip. Anybody feel like they've had their face like drug into the ground sometimes? Come on. Yeah, I, I do. The Bible says, Woe to those who, bless those who spitefully use you. So if someone's used you the wrong way and they've drug your face into the ground, just think I might be a pencil tip. God has a purpose for that. It's, it's not to hurt you. God, Jeremiah 29, 11 says that my thoughts such are these for you. Plans for your hope and a future. Not to harm you. So you might be a pencil tip. Now look at the other side, the eraser. Take a look at that for a second. What is the purpose of the eraser? It is to undo what the other side does. They are not just geographically separated from each other. The two shall never meet. They are literally in opposing purposes. The pencil tip is to leave the impression the pencil eraser is to remove the impression. So think of yourself as a pencil. If you're the pencil tip, every time you go down, you're marking things. Every time you come up, you come back and like, who erased that? I just wrote that down. And if you're the eraser, every time you go down, you're like, who put that there? I just erased it. Think about, think about your life. How many times do you walk through a situation where you walk into something, I just cleaned this mess up. I just took that away. I just put that down. Where did it go? Somebody moved it. Because their job is to move it. The, the eraser's job is to undo what the pencil tip does. And the pencil tip's job is to, un, is to redo what the eraser just took off. That's the... You understand. But some of us get so frustrated because we are a pencil tip looking for an eraser trying to find out who undid what we just did. The only reason you can find the pencil tip if you're the eraser is if the pencil broke. Going to look for something that's wrong with somebody else because it offended you means that you broke something. It's not your job. Your job is to be put back together so that you can be useful for the author. The value of the pencil resides in the hand of the one who holds it for the purpose that they designate. Your job is not to be a pencil tip seeking an eraser. Your job is to understand that an eraser exists. It has a purpose. The pencil tip exists. It has a purpose. We didn't even get to the wood. We didn't even talk about the copper band. But they all have a purpose. And if we get so hung up about what other people do, 
we will never get anything done for the kingdom. There is nothing that anyone has ever done to me that costs 400,000 lives. No one has ever beaten somebody that I love in front of me. I have never lost a child. But I know people who have. And if they can give grace, then I can give grace. Because God's word commands it. And my ability to give grace has nothing to do with what other people do to me. It is the character of who I am. Because the only thing that matters is that on the other side, we are together forever. And there are some of you today that have not spoken to people that you are supposed to love because they did something that upset you. And that is a choice that you have made. But Corey Ten Boom says that the ability, the will to forgive will still function regardless of the temperature of your heart. And some of you need to send a text message to somebody today and just say these words, I love you. And that word, that expression means I love you regardless of what you did to me. I love you in spite of the things you've said about me because you are my forever friend. You are my mother. You are my father. You are my friend. And on this side of heaven, nothing matters because when we get over there, we'll have forever to work it out. I get it. Don't think that people haven't spitefully used me, but I am telling you today that I believe God is saying you cannot hang on to those things and expect good things in return. Giving grace is a breath of fresh air. I love you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I was bitter. I'm sorry I was mad. Grace is forgiving without an apology. You're my forever friend. You can't give what you don't have. We have grace because Christ died for us 2,000 years ago, the most beautiful, perfect human being, God-born, gave his life for you and for me so that we would have the opportunity to love his people forever. And if you don't know what that's like, if you don't know what it's like to know that you've been forgiven, Romans 10.9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. And all it takes is one decision. So with every eye closed and every head bowed, if that's you today, If something I said stuck to you and you're in a place where you haven't felt God's forgiveness and grace, I'm going to count to three and I just want you to raise your hand and we're going to pray for you. One, two, three. I see those hands. I see those hands. You can put them down. And just pray with me. Father, I'm sorry. I'm not perfect, but you love me anyway. I receive your salvation because of what Jesus did on the cross. And I promise to serve you as best as I can from this point forward. In Jesus' name, amen.